Welcome to the Hyper Polygon Activist Learn Languages Make a Difference. My name is Dr. Carlos Yebra Lopez, and today here's our question Do people really think in a given language? Now, this is a classic example of a myth that has been debunked in academia for decades now, but is still very much persistent in public discussion as well as in the corporate sphere. A quick search on Google reveals the following. This is the first result. Seven science-based methods to thinking in a foreign language. Yeah, right. How to think in a foreign language. It does not just happen. How to start thinking in a language you're mastering. How to think in a foreign language. Yada, yada, yada. It's always the same question. It's presupposing that thinking in a given language, let alone a foreign one, can actually happen. How do we get to thinking in another language? And it is not until here that somebody asks, well, is it possible to think in a second language with the implicit idea that it is possible and natural, quote unquote, to think in your first language? And it's only a question when it comes to the second language, the new language you're learning, which again is a faulty assumption. So all the results that we have converge in the assumption that yes, you can and you do think in certain language. However, the truth is much more prosaic. People, including you and me, do not think in any given language. Here's why. <laughs> So people don't think in any language at all. They don't think in their first language. They don't think in the second language, third, etc. let alone in any foreign language, which as I already showed in this channel, is just an arbitrary and pernicious social cultural construct. Now, what people do is they think pre-linguistically or non-verbally, if you like, and then they label their thoughts through language which is very different. Now, the fact that through enough input, so-called massive input theory, your target language is the first language you are now using for labeling purposes, does not mean you are thinking in that language. Or, as put by Michael Error in his recent Babel No More, the search for the world's most extraordinary language learners, what people refer to as thinking in a language comes from being able to speak more immediately in a language without rehearsing it or translating it from a language one might know better. The spoken thought feels as if it's closer to its source in the brain. And these are the key words, feels as if, which is not to say that is actually the case. Here's the kicker. Just because when I've had two Red Bulls, I feel as if I can fly without wings, does it really mean I can actually fly without wings? Does that make sense? So I guess my point is that regardless of how proficient you are in a language or how much input you have received in that language, you never actually think in any language. It only feels like it. The mental computation, the mental processing is independent from language, which is to say thinking does not depend on words. And that's precisely the question that Steven Pinker, professor at Harvard College, addresses in his book, The Language Instinct, page 56. And I quote, is thought dependent on words? Do people literally think in English, Cherokee, Kibunyo, etc., etc.? Or are thoughts couched in some silent medium of the brain, a language of thought or quote-unquote mentalese, as he calls it, and merely clothed in words whenever we need to communicate them to a listener? That's the question that we're trying to elucidate here. And check this out. 
He says, the idea that thought is the same thing as language is an example of what can be called a conventional absurdity, a statement that goes against all common sense, but that everyone believes because they dimly recall having heard it somewhere and because it's so pregnant with implications. Now, and you may ask, well, where is the evidence for this? Well, there is empirical evidence of nonverbal thoughts or languageless thinking in monkeys, in babies, and yes, in adults. And this evidence in turn allows us to articulate a theory of how thinking works. So here we're getting rid of received ideas of how to think in a foreign language. And what we're doing is we're going to the empirical evidence and from there, we proceed with a theory of how thinking and language work. So first, the question of do monkeys, chimpanzees, and other animals think the science by now, 2021, is pretty much settled on this. There is conclusive evidence that, yes, animals do think, even though they do not have named languages such as Spanish, Swahili, etc., in which to express those thoughts. And so already in 1960, British primatologist Jane Goodall showed that some chimpanzees were able to create their own tools. Now, since then, we've come a long way. Remember that Steven Pinker wrote The Language Instinct in 1994. There he showed and discussed experiments in which certain monkeys were able to recognize how their group mates were related to each other. We have further evidence of the fact that some animals can do statistics, including counting. So some animals can count without being able to express those numbers in any given language, such as French or Japanese. And also some animals are able to recognize themselves in the mirror, those showing self-awareness. Now, all of these are cognitive skills. One could object that these cognitive skills do not amount to thinking. But then what is thinking if it's not something tied to culture, such as the ability to create your own tools, computation, such as the ability to count and do statistics, self-awareness included in the ability to recognize yourself in the mirror, etc. And of course, you cannot claim, well, thinking is just being able to speak a certain language because that would be presupposing that which you're trying to prove, that thinking is dependent on language. Now, there's an interesting article by Harvard professor of psychology, Mark Heuser, and I want to draw your attention to these quotes where he claims that animals have interesting thoughts, but the only way they can convey them is by grunts, shrieks, and other vocalizations, and by gestures. When humans evolved speech, they liberated the kinds of thoughts non-humans have. Feedback between language and thinking then boosted human self-awareness and other cognitive functions. So in other words, thinking was already there before humans invented languages, but then the ability to use languages resulted in an increased level of cognition. But this is not to say that thinking is dependent on words. Rather, languages come at a much later stage and reinforce cognitive ability, but that cognitive ability cannot be reduced to the invention and practice of languages. Now, if we switch to human beings, we will begin by speaking about babies prior to their having acquired any words. So there are experiments that show that five-month-old babies are able to do simple arithmetic, such as being sensitive to numbers, prior to their having acquired any words in any language. Again, that shows that there are basic computational skills that are not dependent on words or language. And finally, evidence of thinking without language in adults. And here, Steven Pinker mentions, first of all, people who have suffered from severe brain damage as a result of which they are linguistically impaired. 
but nevertheless have demonstrated a high level of intelligence. Now, a second group of evidence concerns languageless adults, such as the case of a man without words. Now, in this work, written by Susan Shella, she speaks about an immigrant from Mexico, a 27-year-old adult who had not learned any language, and yet he was able to carry out basic mathematical operations within a few weeks prior to learning any given language, such as English, Spanish, etc. Apart from this, a third group concerns creative people. And here, Steven Pinker mentions how creators such as Maxwell or Nikola Tesla, Watson and Crick, etc., relied for many of their discoveries on mental images rather than any form of language. And that, again, shows how thinking without language can go very far. And these are all examples of conscious thinking. On top of this, we still need to consider the many ways in which most of our thinking is unconscious, which adds yet another layer, yet another instantiation of how thinking happens frequently without any linguistic element, whether it is in animals, babies, adults, etc. So now the question becomes, in the words of Steven Pinker, what sense then can we make of the suggestion that images, numbers, kinship relations, or logic can be represented in the brain without being couched in words? And this type of empirical evidence leads to the so-called representational theory of mind, which has two key aspects a representation and a processor. So a representation is a physical object whose parts and arrangements correspond piece for piece to some set of ideas or facts. Whereas a processor is something that can react to different pieces of representation and can do something in response, including altering the representation or making a new one. Hence why, as concluded by Pinker, the representations that one posits in the mind have to be arrangements of symbols and the processor has to be a device with a fixed set of reflexes, period. That is enough to sanction thinking, to sanction reasoning, even when no language whatsoever is present. So in other words, that representation need not, and in fact, cannot look like any human language, like Swahili, like German, like French. Why? There are four main reasons why languages such as Russian, Portuguese, or any language for that matter, is unsuitable as a medium for mental computation. Languages are ambiguous. They lack logical explicitness. They feature co-reference, meaning if I say oh, the tall guy there, him or he, all three expressions refer to the same entity. And finally, so-called the ixis, meaning conversation-specific words. When I say here, there, my, the meaning of each of these words depends on the specific content of a given utterance. So in and on itself, these words do not stand for any given entity. This brings us to conclude with Pinker that people do not think in English or Chinese or Apache. They think in a language of thought. This language of thought probably looks a bit like all these languages. Presumably, it has symbols for concepts and arrangements of symbols that correspond to who did what to whom. But compared with any given language, mentalese must be richer in some ways and simpler in others. It must be richer, for example, in that several concept symbols must correspond to a given English word like stool or stud. There must be extra paraphernalia that differentiate logically distinct kinds of concepts like Ralph's tusks versus tusks in general and that link different symbols that refer to the same thing, like 
the tall blonde man with one black shoe and the men. On the other hand, mentalese must be simpler than spoken languages. Conversation-specific words and constructions like a and the are absent and information about pronouncing words or even ordering them is unnecessary. Knowing a language then is knowing how to translate mentalese into strings of words and vice versa. People without a language would still have mentalese. And babies and many non-human animals presumably have simpler dialects. Indeed, if babies did not have a mentalese to translate to and from English, it is not clear how learning English could take place or even what learning English would mean. And this begs a fundamental question. Well, if the evidence is so clear against the idea that we think in any language, then why is this myth so persistent? And the reason is that it's appealing. It feels good. Oh, I'm thinking in Mandarin. Oh, I, I finally can think in Esperanto. It would be awesome if it were true. Therefore, it has to be true. This is called wishful thinking. Or as Steven Pinker puts it, these claims owe their appeal to a patronizing willingness to treat other cultures' psychologies as weird and exotic compared to our own. Oh, I'm finally dreaming in French. Finally, after three months of intensively studying German, now I can think in that language and understand a whole new world because of it. This is wishful thinking. It feels good. It looks real. It is not. But here's the point. Just because we don't think in any given language, that doesn't make languages and language learning any bit less fascinating. And that's what I think is important. We don't need to exoticize, to fetishize languages in order for us to realize just how amazing it is to study languages and to appreciate them. So thank you for making it to the end of this video. I appreciate your support. And as always, thanks for watching.